Hey folks, welcome back to the Transplant Open again today. My name is Jim Morrow and I'm extremely excited to be with you once again on our brand new series, My Story, My Words. And I'm definitely excited about today's guest. His name is Chuck Estrada. He is a recent heart transplant recipient. As a matter of fact, he's so recent, he's only 29 days out time of recording. So you can add whatever with that. But nonetheless, he is actually a two-time heart transplant recipient. He's currently in the UCLA area doing some recovering, albeit it's going pretty great. So I wanted to jump in, talk to Chuck for a little bit, and certainly let him share his stories, because they are plural, but share his stories with you and tell you a little bit about how things are going, and particularly just let you be inspired by that story. So Chuck, I am again excited to have you with us today. Why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about yourself, maybe your family, your caregiver, that sort of thing. Sure, absolutely. And, and I want to say thank you very, very much, Jim, for having me on. Well, as Jim said, my name is Chuck Estrada. I am now a two-time transplant, as I like to say, survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about, about me, the biggest thing I think people need to know about me is that I was actually born with a congenital heart defect, actually what they consider one of the big three, uh, transposition of the great artery. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, with that meaning, born in the 1970s, uh, I probably, I know I should not be here. But by the grace of God, uh, I've been able to uh, get through life and have my first transplant September 8th of 2013 uh, at 39 years old. Okay. And just more recent here, uh, August 5th of this year, uh, my second heart transplant after almost eight years of having the first. Wow. Uh, I, I am out here with my wife right now, uh, Sarah. Uh, we've been married. Actually, we celebrate our two-year anniversary on September 9th. Uh, coming up here real soon. Uh, and she's out here with me. We are staying here at Ava's Heart uh, near UCLA. Actually, we're really close to Cedar sinai which is where I had my heart transplant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I tell you what, uh, great place to be. It's been incredible. This has been an incredible journey. The second time around has in, been even more so. Uh, as you said, this is my 29th day post-transplant. Uh, I can't even believe it's only been less than 30 days that I'm, I'm out sitting, talking to you in an apartment with my wife by my side, uh, able to really carry on life like better, actually. Yeah than I ever have before. It's incredible, Jim. Well, that's just amazing. And uh, I've, I've given you a shout out before. Some people may have seen that, but part of the shout out was basically, wow, look at this guy and look at his recovery. Of course, you've been there, done that, got some experience, but sure. you know, just how great you were doing to that point. And I just hope and pray that continues to go that way. But uh, you and I share the, the same congenital heart defect. We share the that's same right. thing that we were both babies of the 70s. So it was a very difficult trying time at, at that point and our survival is just i guess some would say a miracle within itself that we're continuing to go on as long as we have and you know even though there's been some assistance in there we, we've done good so far so um that's that's just great so let me just let you start transitioning into your story a little bit by asking you and you answered it briefly but how were you first introduced to transplant and you can pick either one of them i guess the first one sure um so I, I'm actually from Colorado, even though I'm out here in uh, Los Angeles. And I was introduced to transplant through my congenital heart uh, doctor, Dr. Joseph K. there at the University of Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, just like probably you, Jim, before they had the uh, adult con congenital side of things, doctors that were accredited to see patients like us, you know, I actually ended up, I was actually a patient of my pediatric cardiologist mm -hmm. up until I was about 34 years old. So going to see Dr. K through the UCH system, University of Colorado system, he noticed that I had a chance, which most of us don't, as you know, just CHD patients in, in general, mm -hmm. most of us don't have a chance to get to transplant. Right. And he felt that, uh, I, I could be a candidate. Now, a little bit more backstory is that uh, even with my CHD, even with uh, an EF around 30 to 35 percent, I played professional soccer for 12 years. Wow. And I actually just retired from coaching professionally after 13 years last March when COVID hit. Wow. So I, I was lucky enough to 
have parents that did not box me in or put me in a bubble. Uh, what they did is they allowed me to do anything and everything that I wanted to as a kid. And since the heart is a muscle, I was able to strengthen that muscle and I was able to be a high school athlete, a collegiate athlete, and then go on to be uh, a professional athlete for a little while. And I really contributed that to my longevity in life with CHD and the ability to get to heart transplant. And that was also overseen by the University of Colorado originally. Okay. And I went through their self, or I'm sorry, I went through their congestive health, uh, heart failure program. And they listed me in 2010, October 11th, 2010. Okay. I was listed, Jim, for three years uh, at the University of Colorado. And declining not just year by year, but in that last year, month by month. Right. So April of 2013... Uh, UCH reached out to Cedars out here and Cedars at the time had not done, I think they did, I think they said they, prior to me, they'd done three, uh, CHD transplants with two unsuccessful. Mm. So I would be the fourth CHD transplant and they took me on in April I came out here July of 13 for my evaluation, moved here August 1st of 2013, and 39 days later, I was transplanted for the first time here at Cedar sinai Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, very similar stories again. I was never any kind of athlete per se, but my I, I kind of did the same thing. I started out sneaking around to begin with. My parents were real hard on me, but I started out sneaking around to begin with. And that, you know, I always had the note that got sent to school at the first year. He can't run and play and he doesn't need to do this and that. Mm -hmm. well, I would usually just ignore that. And the PE teachers would, they would come around to the idea after I proved myself. And, and so I did the same. I, I, I got to a point by the time I was a teenager that I would go in and they would be shocked at how well I was doing. And I finally owned up to the fact that, well, here's why, you know, I've, right. I've done what I want to do. And so I don't know if those stringent guidelines were correct or not, but obviously we overcame through that. So, so 2010, you're listed for transplant. No luck in Colorado. Sent to California. Correct. Listed. What did you say? 39 days. What was that? Yeah, I was listed 39 days. 39 days. And 39 days. Well, how did the conversation come up? Uh, I guess back up to Colorado for this. How do you go sure. from? Because you're there, you're playing soccer. <laughs> at that right. point and they're looking you and I saying transplant <laughs> yeah uh you know that it you know honestly for me Jim it 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 was something I was hoping for okay. I was hoping that I'd get to the point where I could get transplanted and I remember actually the way that it happened I was um with my family we were at an amusement park uh in Denver and I just was not feeling well uh had some flu type symptoms, uh, just wasn't feeling well and just thought, you know what? I, I just haven't felt this way before, like really, really felt this way. And as fast as it, it came on. Uh, so I, I had my, uh, ex-wife take me to, at the time, take me there to, to the university of Colorado since mm -hmm. we were close to the uh, hospital there in Denver. And uh, they admitted me, and after the first battery of tests, they came back, and, you know, they said my echo showed I, my EF was right around 28%, uh, and I had a little bit of fluid buildup, and it was probably time, the words were, it was probably time to think about transplant. Okay. And at that point in time, I just remember... You know, looking at looking at my ex-wife, uh, giving a call to my dad. My parents live in the same town I do, which is about six miles south of Denver and Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. uh, making a phone call to my dad and and saying, "Dad, uh, it sounds like they're talking about transplant. 
Uh, I don't know if it's really where they're going, but it might be. So you may want to come up and, and get up here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he made the trip up. And the next morning, uh, Dr. K came in uh, with one of the heart failure doctors. And they sat me down and they both said, we want to start evaluating you for transplant. It's time. Okay. Well, I know one of the things that I experienced, and again, kind of parallel to yours, that I knew then, and, and you understand, I think, when I say it, um, we are very tricky to gauge. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm again, wasn't a soccer player, but I would do things and accomplish things physically. I mean, even up to hours before my transplant that nobody else on the hall was doing, you know, I'd get out and walk. I walked three miles the day of my transplant. You know, the day I'm talking about hours before, uh, right. just kept walking the halls because now I had some assistance. I had some men run on on board. I had some tricks up my sleeve, but because my problems reflected differently being congenital, being transposed like you, my, right. my, issues reflected differently you know i wasn't really a guy to get really out of breath uh you know it, i wasn't a guy that kept a lot of fluid in his ankles you know or hands mine was in my belly it was in my face you know things just are different when you're congenital and my doctors always told me that that was the thing that probably scared them as much as anything because they said we go on a cat lab and we see these numbers and these numbers but they don't line up with the general population uh so we don't know if that's good or bad they were afraid that I would have that, you know, drop off point or that crash. And so, um, it, 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 exactly. And that was exactly me too. And, and going back to being an athlete, I mean, my, I conditioned my body, my, my whole point of existence was to push the limit. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know, I didn't know how to not push the limits. I did not know how to push the limits, so I just I kept going. I just right. kept going and going and going, and it, the same thing that we would go. I'd have my casts done. I'd have, you know, my echoes, and they would always say, "Hey, well, we don't know. My creatinine never got low. I mean, there was there was nothing that showed that I was in complete heart failure. Right, but I had an incredible doctor, specific, incredible doctor and a uh, doctor named Simon Shakar, the heart fail one of the heart failure doctors there at UCH that, that said, you know what, I know that you're different. I know you're different. And, and, and in talking with the CHD guys, uh, he said, I'm going to be the one that advocates for this and, and we will get through this. And I, I do absolutely owe my life to Dr. Shakar. 100%. Right. Well, he's, he sounds uh, similar to mine as, as well in that this is important for everybody now, not just for congenital patients, but that the doctors actually listen to the patient uh, because finally my doctor told me, he said, I don't care what the cath lab says. I don't tell what, care what the pulmonary lab says. What matters is how you feel. If you can't get up and brush your teeth, it's time to do this. You know, that kind of a move because yeah. I would come out looking good sometimes i would come out of those cat labs with good numbers sometimes not but you know it seemed to always be the back opposite if i felt like trash my numbers would look great and if i felt wonderful he would say wow we need to put you in the hospital tomorrow you know that kind of thing <laughs> exactly. and uh, so you have to be cautious so that was your first transplant uh we'll we'll uh you, you get listed finally 39 days later you get a heart transplant Right. And, and if I move, if I go back, going back to those conversations there, um, I, they did uh, deny me at UCH three different times mm -hmm. uh, for transplant before we finally got the, the, the fourth, which was a yes. But yes, after that, going, going to California, uh, getting evaluated. And that was the thing we got here. And it was the exact opposite. These guys said, we don't care where your numbers are. We know that you are not doing well yeah so let's do this and that's what we did yeah and uh, again people won't believe it when i keep saying it but <laughs> you know i had four evaluations approved on the third i mean on the fourth just yep. like you and uh yep. 
it, it, it finally came down to a couple of them. They literally argued in the hallway over me. I heard them yelling and screaming. You know, one says listing today, one says wait six months. And then they finally just said, how do you feel? What do we need to do? And uh, so they threw up the threw up the flag and we went in for it and uh, I was listed as well. So, so that was on the first transplant, 39 days, move forward a little bit to the second transplant. We're trying to cover both stories a little bit. Sure. So. Sure. Absolutely. So we, we get to the second transplant. So basically what happened to me, Jim, is that I ended up with uh, transplant coronary artery disease or transplant coronary uh, artery vasculopathy. Right. Cav. Now the mm-hmm. Cav, T cav. And the, the crazy thing is, I showed signs almost immediately after transplant the first time. About my 90-day mark, when I had my last kick-me-out, ready-to-go-home cat, mm-hmm. uh, they noticed. Uh, the other thing, too, here at the at Cedar sinai they do something called the IVIS, which is a, a specific test designed to look for TCAV uh, and, and rate the TCAV so they can obviously make a plan uh, going forward. And I was, again, one of the lucky ones, I say, in, in just uh, to show signs of TCAV immediately with the, with the IVIS. Hmm. So the, the doctors thought for sure that they could put me on uh, a medicine. Uh, the two meds that, that they use for TCAV is either Everolimus or Sirolimus. Right. At the time, uh, Everlimus, this is again eight years ago, it was still pretty experimental. The FDA, FDA hadn't completely approved it, uh, but that's the medicine that I seem to respond better as far as uh, to as far as any side effects. Right. So I, I was put on Everlimus 90 days after transplant. Mm. And we thought, great, we'd be on Ever, I'd be on Everlimus this would be controlled and it was it was controlled for six years okay i had very little i would come back here specifically to have uh every year to have my my heart cast here done at cedars on a yearly basis and year after year we were seeing minimal increments very minimal increments i started out at seven percent to twelve percent by year six it was about 30 percent still not too concerned thinking you know we'll be fine we'll control this but uh 2020 hit and uh, i went from 20 percent to 60 percent in uh, within that year so that was yeah so that was summer to summer so that was summer of 19 september of 19 to September of, uh, I'm sorry, September of 18, no, right, September 19th to September 20. And then they needed to go six months from September and 2020. So that next step was January of 2021 was the earliest. And I'm not kidding. This is my annual. We ended up, because of COVID, I ended up staying there at UCH and having it done there. Went into the cath lab. Uh, they woke me up probably 20 minutes into the procedure uh, with uh, paperwork. And the doctor said, I need to stent right now. We are going to have to put in three cents. I'm letting you know this is very complicated. The, the way we're stenting is not something we do. The fact that we're stenting this transplanted heart is something that we won't do necessarily. Right. But we're at 98% blockage, and I need to stop right now. Wow. And this cab, and, and I've, I've done programs on it before and such, so it is generally, generally slow progressing. I mean, Correct. and yours was for six yeah, years, right. and then it just yep. hit the accelerator, right? Exactly. I mean, absolutely hit the accelerator. And in, in, in the same sentence, he said, I'm letting you know, transplant is now something we have, retransplantation is something we will discuss. Yeah. Mm. And then, and put me back to sleep, finished the procedure. Obviously, they had a conversation with my wife who was there. 
Uh, and, and again, my wife and I have only been together for four years. She wasn't there for the first transplant. Uh, so this for her, just in general, any type of illness or anything is just was new to her just in general. Yeah. And so this, this, this hit her really, really hard. And, and I was, as you can imagine, I was actually more worried about her than I was about me. I figured, you know what, at this point, whatever's going to happen is going to happen and, and I'll be okay. But I was worried about what would, yeah. how, how it would be for her. Well, bless her heart. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah. I, I, I had, I know that feeling. I really do. Um, my wife, uh, when we first started dating, I told her nothing. You know? Of course, I wasn't in the transplant <laughs> arena then either. But, you know, right. congenital growing up, I really told her nothing. Then when she found out, she was kind of heartbroken, like, I can't believe you, you didn't tell me this. And then we right. kind of boasted and coasted for a number of years when there was no issue. And then it just hit right. all at once. So I can't imagine what, what she heard that day. You know, she took you in there yeah. for, your, for your annual follow-up and you was going home, I guess. Exactly. And, and we met and that, and that is something obviously being transplanted at the time. And when we first met, I, I, I let her know, right? you know, and, and in her words, she always says, whether we were, whether we ever got together or not romantically, we knew that we were going to be in our lives one way or the other. And that was something that's kind of helped us yeah. get through this is because we, we hit it off just as, as people and, and we had that understanding. So, yeah, but it, it was a shocker still. I, no one expected this to be four years out, you know, four years later, okay. you know, a year and a half after getting married. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a literal wake up call. He wakes you up to tell you this kind of news. So, <laughs> exactly. okay. So let's bring you out of the cath lab. Um, assuming the, eva the stents were done, the evaluation process, did it start again immediately? Uh, the evaluation process didn't start immediately because I wasn't sure if I was going to have the evaluation done at University of Colorado. Right. So I, I took about a week to, to make some decisions. And then I called the university, I called my doctor at UCH and I said, uh, actually, I'll take that back. We actually ended up going to clinic after. So a week after we went to clinic and, and that's when I told my uh, doctor there at ECH, I said, I think uh, at this point in time, I'm, I'm going to forego my evaluation here at ECH, and I'm going to set up an evaluation at Seekers. Mm -hmm. And his response was, absolutely. We want you to do what you feel is best for you. We will be here now and after. Just do what you got to do. Well, that's a tribute to him. Unfortunately, so many transplant centers, and I'm, you know, I'm not a guy that says go all over the country. You, you didn't do that on purpose, but right. so right. many transplant centers are kind of in hospitals in general. Doctors have a doctors. buck stops here mentality. You know, if, mm -hmm. if I can't fix you, nobody can, and then they won't be of any assistance when you do try to get better care, or, or, in this case, probably just more expedient care. It, not even more expedient here, you know, and I, and we go back to the fact that they sent me to Cedars in the first place. Right. So it, it was, and it's, it was, it's the same set of doctors, although Dr. Shikar had left, uh, he, he's gone now, he's in Florida. The rest of the doctors are of the, on the team are the exact same doctors that I've seen, you know, for the last eight years. Mm -hmm. So they always knew that my, a decision like this would probably mean that I would go back to Cedars and they were absolutely cool about it. So uh -huh. we made that decision. Uh, that was, so we were now in, uh, that was January. We got through March. I set up the appointments and the evaluations here in April. So I came out here the first part of April and, uh, and these guys were incredible here. They did my evaluation. <laughs> they did the evaluation, uh, in, in eight hours. Hey. And <laughs> yep, those and are week long processes generally. Folks. Exactly, exactly. They're usually seven day or five to seven day process. Exactly. Uh, but when I got here, the first thing they said was, "We are sorry. We cannot believe mm -hmm. that this has happened. 
and we want to take responsibility. Not that they had anything to do with, with right. what I got, but they want, they were so willing to do this over again that my wife, again, being the first time around the situation, we're sitting in the doctor's office here. She looks at me and she says, we're not going anywhere else. This is, we're over and done with. This is it. Right. I'm, we're making our decision right now and we're staying here to do this. Wow. And so, and so that's how that went. So they get you listed uh, or they get you evaluated in eight hours. How long were you yep. listed for this second transplant? Then we're, we're going up against 39 days now. So let's see. Yeah, if we, we, beat it. we are. Uh, we did not beat it. Unfortunately, okay. but there are a couple of reasons why uh, I, I ended up with COVID in October of last year. Uh, so I did have some issues, some issues with lungs that they thought I had. Long story short, uh, after evaluation, I needed to get a few things done back home that uh, took a little bit more time than we expected. Okay. I had, uh, I had to do because of the American Cancer Society, I had to do a colonoscopy being already the age of forty-five. Uh, I needed to do bronchoscopy because they thought I had um, the brother to uh, tuberculosis. Uh, the name slips my fa my um, my mind right now. I mean, there were some serious things that we were trying to overcome, and I had to do it all back in Colorado, and I had to do it with doctors um, and their time frames. Uh, so it wasn't okay. like I could. It wasn't like I was admitted into a hospital and we could just get all this done. So it took from April until June 3rd uh, before I had all of that stuff done. Oh, okay. So your evaluation that they did probably in, in Cedars was more of a heart evaluation. And then exactly. they kind of left the other stuff for you to, to get at it's, it's your own pace. So that, that I understand. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I tell people all the time when they talk about the evaluation, you know, some people will say, well, I don't want them to admit me. Well, yeah, you do. Because if they admit you, they can carry you for a test at 2 a.m. and get it done. Exactly. <laughs> Versus exactly. if you're having to go exactly. in and out of offices, you know, over the course yep. of a week or I know a person that took two months, you know, just because yep. of what you're talking about, the logistics of the scheduling. Um, so, yeah, there's there's ups and downs to both. So. You're listed and you're, you're getting to tell us about your wait time. And I, I'm joking with the 39 days because you actually waited three years and 39 days. Right, right. So, but I, I, I do go by the 39 days. I mean, you know, when, when people talk, when I do say, I'm like, listen, I, once I got listed at Cedars, it was only 39 days. Right, yeah. But right. So got all, all the logistics all figured out. All the information got to Cedars. And then June fifteenth was my actual listing date here at Cedars. Okay. So June fifteenth, I'm listed. And at the time, they told us, "Hey, listen, Chuck, you can stay in Colorado. Obviously, now times have changed in eight years. We don't need you to relocate prior to, to transplant." And that is something I had to do the first time. I used my entire life savings yeah. to move out here for my transplant the first time because I had to be by the transplant center waiting, which was obviously a huge, huge burden um, on, on my life, my family, and just everything at the time. Fast forward to now, they're telling me, hey, no problem. We will, you know, you can get the call. It doesn't change it. You know, you don't get skipped if, on the list or anything like that. If we do get an offer, we get an offer, we'll call you, we'll give you the time to get down here. Right. So it's great, no problem. But I was coming back up on needing another uh, right heart cap and angiogram because of the timing of everything, right? My last one was in, in January when they found everything okay. and they wanted to go every six months. So July rolls around. And I actually asked them, they were, they were willing to wait until this month. They were willing to wait until September to uh, give, do the angiogram and all that. But I, I don't know if I, Jim, if I just had a feeling. I, no, I did have a feeling. I just had a feeling like I, I had to get out here sooner than later. Mm -hmm. 
So I just asked them, I said, what if I came out in July? If I can come out in July, can we get this done? And, and who knows, maybe I get the call before then, you know, I'm still thinking about 39 days as right. before, you know, sure. I'll come out and I'll do this. So I come out with my father, July 21st. And again, kind of thinking about how this is going to go. My dad and I just decided, you know what? We're going to drive out there. I'm going to take some clothes and possibly find a place to stay. Uh, but we'll, I think we'll just stay out there. And we just made that decision on the fly. We drove out here. The 23rd, I had my uh, all my testing done. The following Monday, Tuesday, I went in to clinic. And they were, at the time, they were trying to decide whether or not they wanted to admit me and have me wait in hospital mm -hmm. or tell me I could go home. We were there to tell them if they did not admit me that we were willing to stay in town if need be. Again, kind of thinking maybe it will happen as fast as it did last time. Mm -hmm. So we go in and, and the doctor says, listen, if I'm going to grade this on an A to F scale, you're a D minus. And I, 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 I never understood why he gave me a D minus versus an F because they're really honestly, in my mind, there's no difference. Yeah. And now afterwards, I understand why. And the reason was, is they did not want to put me out. They did not want me to be in a hospital still feeling well enough to where I would absolutely have, I, I go nuts in the hospital waiting or, and they did not want me to have to spend money and wait here in town if that were the case. Mm -hmm. So I think they were trying to be kind of politically correct in saying, well, go home if you want to. We'd rather have you here. But if we put you in the hospital, we don't know if that would be good for you because right. I wouldn't I wouldn't be on drip. I wouldn't I mean I would just literally be sitting in the hospital as I waited. So we I called up Ava and I gave Ava the rundown of the situation. And this incredible woman said, Chuck, you can stay at Ava's house. I have space right now. We don't do it. We never do it. But for you right now, you can stay at Ava's house pre-transplant. Wow. And once we got that confirmation, I called the doctor back up and I said, I'm staying here. Don't worry about anything else. Right. And they said, okay. So that was July 26th. And then we fast forward. If I do my, my math right, exactly 14 days later, August 4th, I get the phone call. <laughs> okay, folks, we're talking to Chuck Estrada, who is one of the few people I've ever met who nearly scheduled his heart transplant. <laughs> you, you may as well just put a dot on the calendar and say we're going to do it within this two-week period because yeah, uh, you, that, you made the right was call incredible. yes thank god i did honestly yeah, absolutely yeah. well they they helped you with the decision but you definitely made the right call on that and you got the best of both worlds you know that um being out of hospital but yet without as much financial burden. I mean, there's no better mix than that. The only thing better oh, no. is I guess to be sitting at home watching TV, when, you know, and, and walking <laughs> exactly. next door to get a, get a transplant. That would probably beat it, but that'd be, that'd be the only thing that would do so. Well, so. On, honestly, Jim, that's what I did. I walked the night that I got the call on the fourth. I walked to the hospital. The hospital is a five minute walk. Yeah. I walked to the hospital, uh, with Ava as a matter of fact, my dad had to go home. I have a 104 year old grandmother that lives with my father there in Colorado. And so he had to go home. My wife was, we worked it out with my wife and my father, um, that Ava would be my caretaker here or my caregiver here prior. And then when, obviously when we got the call that they would come out immediately, mm -hmm. which is exactly what happened. But yeah, so Ava, once again, 
uh, she she and I uh, walked to, to Cedars. She stayed with me as long as she could until they kicked her out at 10 o'clock. And uh, I went back that night at 1230. And they put me on the table at 230 in the morning, uh, August 5th. What a whirlwind again. I mean, uh, it was, it was, I mean, I, I, I had no time to think. I, it just was five o'clock, get the call and five forty-five, starting to walk to Cedars. Wow. I have, uh, you know, again, there's no scientific, there's no statistic to prove this. I wouldn't even try. I don't have time or, or care, but just in my experience from dealing with so many people around, you know, around this whole transplant thing, it is so typical for a 12, 14, 16 hour wait yes. between the call and the, and the proper surgery. And even then, um, you know, that I've seen, it's just about the standard thing. We'll get you in 5 a.m. in the morning. Well, that's 5 a.m. turns to 10 and 10 turns to 2. And, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's always a lot, generally a lot longer right. than, than anyone expects. But, uh, what a wonderful thing that this was working like it was. So you go into surgery, um, you pop out somehow, like coming out of a toaster, it looks like. <laughs> exactly. Um, tell us a little bit about your recovery. Absolutely. Uh, and, and this is the most incredible thing, and this is something I still cannot believe. So I was just telling my wife and uh, my new friend Sierra Davis' house. It This time around, it is like I never had my first transplant. And I think maybe... Maybe you can relate when I say this, Jim, uh, s since we've paralleled each other in so many ways. I have never, ever, ever known what it has been like for a normal person to wake up, feel good, and just go about their day. I've never, mm -hmm. never in my life, even after my first, well, maybe for you after your transplant, but even after my first transplant, it was a struggle. I, yeah. that first transplant before the, the, the huge issues towards the end, I, I was, I, I, I never felt like I got better. Mm -hmm. Well, the, developing, developing TCAV within 90 days. Yeah. In you, theory, you exactly. didn't. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And, and I always felt like I, I, I always felt like Jim, I always felt like, People worked, had to work at feeling good. Mm -hmm. I never knew that you could just wake up and go, man, today's really a good day. Yeah. I mean, I would wake up and go, man, I'm going to work on today being a really, really good day. And I would get through those days and I would feel like they're a good day. But now I woke up and this is what I said. If transplant was, could have been done with just trans literally transporting the heart out of my donor into mine without surgery. When I woke up minus the breathing tube, if you would have taken that out and all the, if it was just me, someone throwing the heart in, I would have ran a marathon. Mm. That is it. how good I felt. I love it. That, I mean, absolutely immediate wake up, just what the hell just happened to me because never in my life have I ever thought this was going to be possible. That's mind boggling. Mind boggling. My initial recovery was extremely quick. Um, I was walking three or four miles within a week, but it's still, it's it gotta be a different feeling than that, than what you're experiencing. So that's, that is amazing. So I, I want to add to that. Well, tell me about your recovery since, but come on, it's man, it's been 29 days. So what do you know about recovery <laughs> other than you're out and you're, and you're functioning and you're basically walking to your clinic visits. Yeah, not only am I walking just like you that, that weekend. So I got out Thursday on the 12th from Friday through Sunday. I walked a total of 15 miles. My uh, daughter and son-in-law came in to visit. We, uh, say this or not, um, we went and did tour stuff. Yeah. And not only did we do tour stuff, nobody else could keep up with me. 
I mean, and I couldn't, I couldn't believe I, I, I had no aches, no pains other than my chest pains from everything. But I mean, no leg pains, no nothing. I just got up and I went and it's been that way every day since that's and 29 days I have been doing, I have, we have not stopped. We went to the to the zoo for my wife's birthday a couple of days ago. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's just been, I get up and I don't want to stop doing, and that's what I've been doing. That is great. That is just great. And we'll just continue to pray that that'll be years of you telling the same old story. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and I, so and many, really whatever has clicked, I hope it clicks for so many more people, which I think a lot of it is just the shape that you've kept your body in, you know, not trying to on purpose be an athlete, although you were, but right. I mean, you, you just saw something in your future and, and you didn't allow the TCAB to pull you down and, and, and such. And I, you know, I had had my aortic valve replaced a couple of years ago. So I kind of had that, right. I remember that, that little bump that's similar to the TCAB as far as, I kind of got on this mountain peak and then that came up and, and right. I had to get over that one, you know, which it was probably very easy procedure the way I had it done, but it was probably more of a mental. Yeah. A mental thing. Like, yep. because I was going, Oh no, is this happening again? You know, right. Please tell me this is not happening again. And thankfully, you know, they got on top of it and, we're doing what we do. So tell me this, and you may have to reach back eight years to the old one for half of this question. You'll understand it. Tell me the best and the worst part of transplant for you. Wow. Okay. Well, the best part of transplant is kind of twofold. The number one is being able to live, coming out of this and being able to live a healthy life moving forward. Mm -hmm. The fact that I know now that I can, I am in, I again am in charge of what I can do moving forward. And, and that does not happen without my donor. And that is something that I give thanks to every day without either one of my donors. I mean, I'm not here. So yeah. I make sure every day that I do not just do things for me. I do things for the both of them and I do things for their family. Yeah. I try to be a better person and I try to do things. I say the right way. What I mean by the right way is be active. Don't waste mm -hmm. any day that, that I have. Absolutely. And, you know, you could, someone could take this and say, well, look, you know, his, his first heart, you know, eight years and he had these issues come up after 90 days. Well, your first donor, they are in hindsight, duty of this whole thing just looks to be to get you to the second, exactly. to get you to this opportunity. That's Because exactly without the first, it, the second never comes. So Exactly. Exactly. And that's it. Jim, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly how I view this. The, f the first one was to give me the strength. Oh man, going to get emotional. Um, uh, he gave me the strength to, to understand why I have my life to, and what to do with it. Yeah. So absolutely. I mean, that's, that, that's an everyday, every second thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a blessing. Well, let's dig down deep and find the worst thing. Ah, man, the worst, <laughs> you know, the worst thing for me, Transplant wise, it's never been the pain. It's 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 never been going through the 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 physical process of it because, as you know, um, being a CHD patient, especially living with uh, uh, transposition, mm -hmm. uh, 
every day was always a struggle anyway. I, it, 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 it's been for me the re reality of what I would, how I would leave my family mm -hmm. and, and how much pain it would cause them. And that's, that's been the most difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can get through the physical, yeah. for me, the physical pain, the, the emotional strength, um, I've, I've conditioned myself for the last 47 years, uh, you know, on, on how to deal with that. I mean, that's, that's what we've done. Uh, but no, I mean, that's, especially to get through that first transplant and, and see what it meant to my father, right? you know, my mother who I lost, uh, the the year after trans well not even a year after transplant the December after uh, September of thirteen but she, I, I she held on uh, until I could get the transplant I know that yeah she saw that so, opportunity yep, yep so yeah that's been beautiful beautiful story. It's no doubt a real, real life journey. That's what it is. I mean, it's, I say oh, story yeah, exactly. and it's, the story doesn't fit. I mean, I always say that, but it doesn't fit any of us really. It's a journey. Yeah, it, it's a journey. It really is a journey. Yeah. What is the best piece of advice you could give someone who either they're waiting transplant or maybe they're just shortly thereafter? What's going to keep them motivated? Yeah. You know, all I can say is, is you have, you, you, as hard as it is, and we've all had those days, I've had those days, I've had doubts, I, I've wanted to give up, but as much as those ideas and thoughts come into our head, you can't. Yeah. You, 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 you really have to, even if it's digging down a, a, a certain day or a certain week, you, you really have to Think about what the benefit is from this. Hmm. And the benefit is twofold. The benefit is life for you and life for the one that was lost. Yes. And the, if you can think of it that way, at least for me, it makes it this process, this journey, this idea easy and completely understood. Right. And, yes. and if I can give that advice, that's, that's because we'll break or I shouldn't say we'll break, we'll bend, mm -hmm. we'll bend, we'll bend, we'll bend. But understand that it did, it does take something, someone, a family to completely break for you to have your chance and at another piece of an ongoing journey. And if you can't look at it that way, then I don't know. Then that's just, to me, that's, 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 that's means that you don't grasp this, yeah. the idea of, of transplant. Yeah. Well, these donors, these donor families, I mean, they, they gave, they are giving, let me say that they are giving yeah. life. Yes. And that's not to be misunderstood as to someone to live haphazardly. You sure, you certainly don't. I don't. And few do, but that is giving life to be lived and to be the fulfillment of what their child it's somebody's child, yeah. what their child, what their parent, what their whomever, the relationship, what they were trying to live, what they were doing with life. And, and you're to take that in and flourish with it and to build on it. So it sounds like you certainly are doing that. It, it's a, it's the absolute least I can do. Yeah. The absolute least For I sure. can do. 
Well, Chuck, it has been outstanding to talk with you. Um, for the record, he could have talked with me probably two or three weeks ago, as far as the way things have gone. But we got to we got to arrange schedules and get and get together like we have. So, I'm just grateful to be able to talk to you. Grateful to be able to share both of your, you know, accounts of your journey. Maybe I'll use that word instead of story, but the accounts of your journeys. And uh, I hope that someone will be inspired by it. Uh, let me say also that if you're listening to this or watching this, however you've got a hold to it, and, and you'd like to tell your story, I would love to share your story because every single one of these motivates someone to live on any side of these relationships as well as potentially bring on the possibility for yet another person to receive a gift of life. I think this is the biggest thing we can do for organ donor awareness and for motivating people to at least see what is made possible by organ donation. So uh, to you, I'm just so grateful to talk with you, Chuck, and, and thankful for your story. And I look forward to, uh, let's put a pen down, and we'll talk every couple of years until we get to about year 50. And uh, Sounds good to me. So your grandmother's living right now is 104, so I have to do some math. <laughs> yeah. I better hang on if I'm going to be talking to you when you're your grandmother's <laughs> age. But <laughs> You and I both, and yeah. I tell you, that woman is, is an incredible woman, and, and yes, I, I do uh, draw strength and, and inspiration from her. But I do have to say, Jim, you know, we, we, we've been friends from afar for, for a long time here, and what you do for the community and just for people in general um, it is incredible. I mean, just to find... To, to talk to you, to talk to people that have your vision and your passion and be able to apply it for others to witness. I, 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 you are, you, I'm a, a huge fan of yours and I appreciate what you do. So I need to thank you for that. Well, I'm, you're, I'm very blessed with the opportunity and uh, to get cross paths with people such as you. Um, it's been a blessing as well. You've inspired me. And uh, so we'll just keep moving forward together. We'll do that. Absolutely. And we'll do our work. Well, I'm going to get back with you another day because we did not talk about Ava uh, very much. No so we'll get no an problem. exclusive with you and Ava one day. But for right now, uh, we'll call it to a close. Again, if you'd like to get in touch with me and tell your story, my number will be here on the screen. You can reach out to me on Facebook, on uh, pretty much every platform, especially in the comments below the video. And I'd love to tell your story. And uh, Chuck, I wish you the very best. I'll be praying for your continued recovery. And uh, I wish you just a great life. Thank you for honoring your donor. And thank you for being with us today. Absolutely. And thank you very much. Thank you. All right.